I'm uh, extremely thrilled to have Matt Hamilton here and uh, that I'm allowed to introduce him. He is uh, one, not, not one, but he's the most important person for Plone these days because he is the <laughs> president of the Plone Foundation. Uh, the thing with the Plone Foundation is it's not like he's the president of the United States and he's allowed to uh, launch nukes against Title III or anything else. Uh, the Plone Foundation and the Plone community is much more democratically organized than uh, the United States of America in this way. <laughs> but um, still, the uh, Plone Foundation is an important uh, uh, important body in the uh, infrastructure and the uh, ecology of Plon. Uh, but he's not only the president of the Plon Foundation, he's also one of the inaugural directors when the Plon Foundation first was set up. He is technical director of NetSite, one of the most prolific uh, Plon uh, consultancy companies in, I'd say, the whole wide world. But uh, is based in Bristol, so most of his business in, is in the UK, but not all. If you uh, will be here for the talk tomorrow morning, he'll talk about a German project that he's uh, done, uh, about uh, Carglass Internet for a huge German company, carglass.de. Um, he's also the organizer of the Plon um, Conference of 2010 in Bristol. So we have uh, the latest three, uh, two phone uh, conference organizers here as keynote speakers, and that's also a way for us and the whole community to say thank you for these people who put in a whole lot of uh, amount, a whole lot of work into organizing these conferences, and that's great effort. And I love these two conferences. I'm very. It's very sad that the uh, the guys from Four um, Four Digits who are doing the conference uh, this year in Arnhem in Netherlands are not going to be here, but they are working on the conference. So what they do is they just launched their net site, a website yesterday. Check out cloneconf with a c dot org uh, and you can also already register for the conference. And thank you for coming here and thank you Matt for being here, although your wife just had an operation and thanks to her for setting you free for a <laughs> short time. Uh, have fun with the keynote, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Philip, for that glowing introduction. So first of all, I'd like to just start off and ask, uh, well, first of all, everybody hear me OK with the microphone? Yeah? Good. Can I ask who here, this is the first Plown event they've been to, the per first Plown conference or sprint or whatever. Please put your, the Erste Zatz, if you like. My German's not that good. Quite a, quite a lot. That's probably about 50% of the people here, which is fantastic. That's, that's really great to see that 50% of the people here, this is the first event they've been to, and hopefully this will be the first of, of many events uh, that we'll go along to. So the talk that I'm doing here, um, it's titled, It's Like Buying a Relationship. Now, this, this really came out of a blog post that was written, or an article that was written by an analyst about two weeks ago, a woman called Irina Guseva, who is an analyst with a company called Real Story Group. Uh, some of you may have come across them. They do a lot of very good in-depth analysis on uh, content management and things like portals and enterprise search and the likes. But she wrote a blog post that had a couple of uh, statements in it that kind of got me a bit fired up. Your budget can start at $5,000, $20,000, 50000 100000 or 250000 just for the license. It is still a common misconception that open source WCM, web content management, is free. You may not pay a license, but you get what you pay for. I was like, really? Really? This is 2012 and this is still the attitude that you've got about open source? Yeah, open source is, is, is powering so many aspects of the internet that we know today. Uh, well, it has been since the dawn of time, but people are, people are realizing it now. You know, the whole cloud computing, sort of whole revolution that's happening with cloud computing is basically powered by open source. And mainly because of the licensing um, freedoms within open source that allow you to do that. <coughs> Another statement. When selecting a CMS, think of it as buying a relationship. 
rather than just buying technology. It's like marriage. Have you examined the company's financials, viability, stability, roadmap, vision? Divorces are expensive. Doing your homework before signing the dotted line is like a prenup. Now this got me, again, this, this got me, I, was, I, I commented on her article there and I was, I, I was really quite angry about it. And I was thinking, <coughs> buying a relationship, is that how you're viewing the software that you're working with, that you're buying a relationship? I mean, how many relationships that start off with, you know, start off with a, a, an envelope of cash being handed from one person to another are really, you know, that long-standing, successful relationships? There might be some, uh, you know, instant gratification there, but it's not going to be a long-term thing. In terms of buying a relationship, yes, you can buy services, you can buy products, you can buy expertise, but... I don't think you can actually buy a relationship. Now, maybe I'm taking her words a little too literally here, but it, it was something that got me quite, quite, quite excited from what she said. Um, now, really, the thing with open source is it addresses the balance of power between the client and the vendor, between the service provider and the, and the end user. And I'm going to talk a bit about this uh, later on. But I thought, OK, well, maybe, maybe she has got a point. Maybe you can buy a relationship. Maybe, maybe you do buy, actually buy a relationship. And I did a bit of research, and purchases come down into two, two main types. Things that are called transactional purchases. So going to buy toothpaste, uh, car insurance these days, probably the same in, in Germany um, or your, your home countries, in that you don't really buy car insurance based on a relationship at all anymore. You, you, you go to a website, and you find the cheapest, and you buy it. And that's, that's, you, you don't really want to talk to anybody. Um, you, you go to the shops, you buy milk. You know, there's no relationship there. But there are some purchases in which you do actually have a relationship. Things like financial investments. You, know, you probably have a relationship with a financial advisor or a bank manager or whatever who gives you some advice, who knows a bit about your circumstances. But the chances are you, you sort of buy that relationship. Or do you? Maybe you buy the services and the relationship is what comes for free. Maybe that's what you build up. Uh, medical insurance, things like that. You, there's more of a relationship there in the purchase. But I still believe that you buy the services and the products and not the actual relationship. The relationship is something that you have to build, you have to work on over time. And it's based upon trust, and it's based upon the actions between both parties. So is it all going to be love and roses in a relationship, or is you know, somebody trying to break free? I mean, what's, what's, what's going to happen with these relationships as things go on? So let's look at things a little further with regards to software relationships. So in terms of buying a piece of software, uh, there used to be a model, well, there is a model, rather, uh, in which you have a vendor of a piece of software, you have an implementation partner, and you have the end client. This is the model that's used in a lot of commercial content management systems. You, you will go and you will have a piece of software from a commercial um, content management system, uh, somebody like Kentico or, um, mine's gone blank, Ektron or somebody like that. And then there will be an implementation partner. They will have a, a reseller network and they will have these implementation partners that will actually do the implementation. And then there's the client. So the client generally has a relationship with the implementation partner rather than the vendor. Sometimes there is a relationship directly with the vendor. Sometimes you, you can have this relationship in which you, as, as a client, from a client's point of view, you have a relationship with both the implementation partner and the vendor. There's a little story I'm going to tell about a particular other content management system that works on a uh, commercial open source basis uh, in terms of they have an open source and an enterprise version that they sell. They had an event going on and uh, called something like uh, content management in government or something like that. And uh, I thought, oh, that looks great. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll apply to go along to their event. It's tomorrow. It's in, in London. I'll, I'll go along to it. And I filled in my details on the form, hit submit. And the reply I got back was a very short reply that just said, we cannot accommodate your request to attend. Now, I thought that's, that's very strange wording. I mean, I don't know if that sounds strange as well, 
you know, if English is not your first language, but it's, it's, it's a very short request. It's not, sorry, we're full, or, you know, sorry, you know, whatever. It's, we cannot accommodate your request to attend, which I thought, That's, that sounds a bit bizarre. I, want, I really want to go along to this event. I think there's something strange going on here. So I, uh, I applied again. <laughs> this time as somebody else. I picked a name up, took various names of people I knew and joined them together, went to Gmail and kept hitting in names until I could find one that wasn't taken for an address, <laughs> and uh, submitted the request. Name, Marcus Mutton, IT consultant. Organisation, central government. Now, I don't know if any of you have been to any large trade shows. You'll quite often get people that come along from some government agency, but they're not really allowed to tell you where they're from. So I thought, this should be, this should be a good enough cover. This should be a good guise. Um, if, if they say which part of, you know, uh, central government you're from, I'll just say, I, I can't tell you, you know. I'd have to shoot you. Um, so let's go with that. So, 6 o'clock the next morning, I was in my car, driving to London, it's about an hour and a half away, going down the motorway, and I pulled into the motorway services, and there, I don't know again in, in other countries, but in the UK, you sometimes find these business card machines. And you put in five pounds, and you can choose your design, you know, with flowers or dogs or whatever. And so I choose, choose a plain one, put my details in, and, and there we go. So there's, there's my business card, and I had a stack of these business cards, and I took them along. I thought, ha-ha, I've got proof now if somebody, if somebody asked something. So back to this model. I went along to this event, and there were several parties speaking at the event. There was uh, a couple of end customers that were doing case studies. There was somebody from the software company itself, the vendor, and there was somebody from the implementation partner. And they, they each did a sort of a, a bit, and there was questions at the end. And they talked about support contracts. And so I sort of put my hand up, and I was being a bit confrontational, I suppose. Uh, and I said, so, so who do I get my support contract with? Do I get it from you, the implementation partner, or, or you, the vendor? And they sort of both said, yes. OK. Well, both. I said, so why do I, you know, what happens? So it's 2 o'clock in the morning. My phone or pager is bleeping because my site's gone down. Who do I call because something's screwed up? Do I call the implementation partner or do I call the vendor? And they said, well, the, the implementation partner. And I said, so why do I need a support contract with a vendor? And they said, oh, because that then gets you the patches and the updates and that, and, and if anything serious goes wrong. And I said, okay, so if you're the vendor, are you going to warrant the work that the implementation partner has done? Because if the implementation partner has done some sort of customization, are you going to you know, support that? In the same way that if you take your car and go and stick a great big exhaust on the back and stupid fat tires and take it back to your main dealer, they're not going to you know, accept the warranty and say that, yes, they'll fix the problem. They'll say, it's, it's your fault, you've done something stupid. So you know, who do I kick at 2 o'clock in the morning when something's going wrong? You know, this is a serious question. And they, they couldn't really come up with a, with a, a reasonable answer. And I thought that was quite an interesting thing with regards to relationships. The relationships are, can be a lot more complex. Going back to Plone, well, Plone, we don't have a vendor in Plone. There isn't a Plone Incorporated. There isn't a, a, a Plone company that sells Plone itself. There's the Plone Foundation, and that just sort of oversees some of the, the legal goings on and, the, and a bit of the marketing in that. But there isn't one sort of plone company. If you look at someone like, if you look at a um, Drupal, so with Drupal, there is a sort of a Drupal incorporated now. It's called Acquia. Started about six years ago by one of the founders of, uh, well, the, the founder of Drupal, Dries, who created this company, Acquia, to do this commercial support. In the plone world, we've gone almost completely the opposite way, and, and quite explicitly so. So some of you who've been in the, in, in the Plone world for a while will remember there was a company at one point called Plone Solutions, started by Gare Beckhold, Alex Leamy, um, Alex Leamy being one of the co-creators of Plone. And that company took a conscious decision to rename themselves from Plone Solutions to Jarn. And the reason being that they didn't want to be perceived as being the Plone company. 
because that then sets an, an unlevel playing field for the other companies within the Plone ecosystem. So within Plone, we've got a much, much flatter, uh, a flatter environment, a flatter ecosystem within, within, the, within the software and within the companies uh, that implement the software. So instead of a vendor, what we've got is we've got community. All of you guys here. Um, all of the events that happen worldwide, the mailing lists, the bug trackers, et cetera, et cetera. That community bit is a bit that effectively replaces the vendor. And the fantastic bit with that being is that it can't be taken over, it can't be sold on Wall Street to another company or shut down or, you know, in the content management world, there's a lot of acquisitions that happen that companies buy companies that buy companies and they will shut down pieces of software that they've acquired. If you look at the relationship between Morello immediacy and Alterian, you had one company buy another company buy another company and they ended up with three content management systems owned by one company and, and you know, Alterian are now being bought by another company and they're going to drop one of them. Well, if you're the customers that happen to start at that particular point in time, well, sorry, you're going to have to move to another one of their systems. And that's probably in a totally different programming language, so you're, going to, you know, you're not going to be able to port over a lot of the customizations of work you might have done. So within Plone, we've got the community. And the great thing with the community within Plone is the community is worldwide. We've got things like the symposiums, the conferences, events like this that are going on, sprints. It's, it's a very global community. And actually, that's another question to ask here. So how many people here are from Germany, Austria, Switzerland, a German-speaking country? Put, put your hands up. I probably should have done this the other way around. How many people are not from Germany, Austria, Switzerland? Right, probably about 10 in the room. Right. There is a lot going on all around, all around the world with Plone. I did a keynote at the Plone Symposium East in the US last year, and I asked that same question. And I was trying to find out who'd, who'd come the furthest. And, Somebody sort of suggested that coming from the UK to the, to the US, I, I was probably the furthest from most of them because most of them were in the US. But there was one guy there, a guy called uh, Michael Wunderlich, who was a first time, the first time he'd been to a plane event. And he was from Australia. And he'd flown a two hour flight from Adelaide to Sydney, a seven hour flight from Sydney to Taipei, a two hour flight from Taipei to Osaka, a 12 hour flight from Osaka to New York, and then a four and a half hour Chinese bus ride from New York to Penn State University. That's, you know, that, that's quite some dedication for somebody to travel <laughs> that far. You know, say, say, putting, it, putting it lightly, that's, you know, that's the amazing thing with the Plone community is there's, there's people all around the world um, doing all this kind of stuff. But, you know, it's not all, it's not all serious stuff. Some of you may remember, you know, recognize this guy. This is Calvin Hendricks Parker. He was my predecessor as the uh, Plone Foundation president and uh, uh, runs a company called um, Six Feet Up in the US. Now, if you can, how's the projector doing with that? That's really not doing those trousers justice. So those gold trousers were owned by Gogo. Is Gogo here? It's probably still sleeping. No? So uh, they were own, owned by an Austrian called Gogo. And uh, they ended up at some point in the evening ending up on Calvin. And this is Calvin wandering around the streets of Bristol with these shiny gold pants on. So it's, it's, not all, it, it's not all serious stuff. There's a lot of fun stuff that happens. But the global reach of Plone, uh, this is a guy called Andrew Nogueira, who is presenting World Plone Day in Sao Paulo. He's the organizer of World Plone Day this year. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, but World Plone Day is a whole load of events that happen locally. What is great about Plone and the Plone community is, as well as the sort of international aspect of the, of, the, of the software in the community, we actually have the localization of the community within those various areas. Now, that happens on the, on the, in the commercial world as well. You know, if I call up Ektron and say, you know, hey, I want somebody in wherever, Singapore, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got a, a, a partner or a reseller or somebody in Singapore we can put you in touch with. But within the Plone community, it's not something that comes from the top down. It's these grassroots uh, communities that form. So Plone Italia, for instance. You know, Plone Italia, there's some, we've got some Italians here. There. Um, 
Clone Italia was a group that was formed to provide Italian language content about Plone and information about Plone. And, uh, you know, the, the amazing thing with this is, is, you know, if you know Italians, they have their fiery Mediterranean temperament, and to get, you know, eight, say, six, whatever, Italian Plone companies in one room and get them to actually work together and produce this is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun task. I think they did very well. Um, it, was, it was modeled on, I think, the Dutch uh, Plone user day. Um, and and the, the, the Dutch, again, they had a user day in which I went along, I was fortunate enough to go along and speak at the user day. And again, they had about six Plone companies from the Netherlands. Netherlands is a small country, but has probably the highest density of Plone companies, I think, of any country in the world. And they were all working together. They're all, they're all competitors, but they were there with their clients working together and doing all of these talks. And again, all of the talks were in Dutch, much like here in, in, in German. I was at a trade show and we were doing demos of Plone and this Japanese guy came up and was asking, you know, what is Plone? His English wasn't very good. My Japanese is non-existent. And, you know, he was, he was you know, trying to find out what Plone is. I thought, well, I know there's some Japanese stuff that happens with Plone. Every morning, um, you know, when I look at Twitter and I look, you know, search for the keyword Plone, every morning there's always a whole bunch of stuff from Japan. And you can see it's a whole bunch of characters I don't understand and the word Plone, and then a whole bunch of characters, right? Um, and at, at, the, at the Plone conference in Bristol, I actually said to one of the guys, I said, please, please stand up and do a lightning talk about what's going on in Japan, because it seems like there's so much happening there in the Plone world, but for a Westerner, is, is, is almost impenetrable, you know, to find out exactly what they're doing. And he stood up and showed, this is the university site that we've done in Plone, this is a big, you know, one of the big shopping sites in Plone, and et cetera, et cetera, and there's fantastic stuff they're doing there. I typed Plone Japan into Google and hit a button, and up came this site. And I've, I had no idea this even existed, this site at the time. This is Plone.jp. This is the Japanese Plone site. And... You know, the guy was able to look at that, read through, click on various links, and find out a bit more about Plone. And this was all set up by, you know, a user group in Japan. And for various market sectors as well. So this is Plone EDU. This was a, a group set up by one of the guys from Penn State, Mike Harm, and, and various other people. And this is aimed towards the higher education sector. And I believe here at this event, there was a, a parallel track about uh, Plone in schools, was there? Yeah. So, I mean, education is a big aspect for Plone. There's, there's, there's a, a, a big market there for using Plone within education. So it, it's great that there's this vertical market. And if anybody here is, is involved with Plone education in this country, it would be good to try and get in contact with the Plone EDU guys in the US um, and maybe have some feedback between them. But, I mean, you, you guys here will know, know all this because you've got the Plone, the, 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 the German-Austrian... Swiss Plone site. You know, again, this is Plone content coming from you guys. You know, this is not, again, this is what I'm saying, this is not some top-down thing. This is grassroots. This is even more powerful. These are people that want this information out there. And this event, I mean, this is fantastic. There's, what, over 150 people here at this event. Um, and, you know, this is a German-speaking event. This is just one part of the world uh, with an event in a you know, particular language. And that's, that's great that this, you know, that Germany has a long history of this with, with, with previous events, things like Dietzug, um, you know, and, and this Plone conference as well, I think is fantastic. So going back again to the sort of relationships um, with, with uh, software, uh, there's a guy called Janus Boy who runs a consultancy, Jay Boy, and he's broken down the types of sort of integration partner into five different categories. You've got the management consultancies. These are the big, you know, Deloitte's and people like that that do the big sort of strategic level consulting for companies. And they might use content management as part of a solution to whatever problem it is they're trying to solve. You have the system integrators, people like Capgemini, EDS, those people who take a lot of knowledge of a lot of different systems and put them together for, for a customer. A customer has a requirement that's going, to rec that's going to involve a lot of different systems. They will implement them. They might not have very specific knowledge, and they might partner with another company that has specific knowledge of each system, but they are the sort of overall company that works on this. You've then got the boutiques, the sort of small 
companies, one person, up to 20 people, very specialist knowledge, very involved generally with the software itself, know it inside and out. And, uh, you know, small organizations are a lot more nimble normally, a lot more agile. You've got the vendor PSO, the vendor professional services organization. So if you go to somebody like Microsoft, uh, they will have a team of people that will have direct experience in SharePoint and be able to implement it for you. Be prepared to pay for it, they won't be cheap. You might think that they are the, the experts since they work in that company, but like within any big company, you might be getting you know, their top guys, you might be getting the people that they've just recruited off the latest recruitment drive from the university, and they might have as much information about the product as you do. So you don't really know, uh, and this is something that you've got to be very careful of if working with these, these sort of organizations. And then, of course, you've got the in-house IT team. So if you work within an uh, a university or an institution or a large company, then you might have an in-house IT team that do clone work directly there. Now, most clone companies, as far as I'm aware, I've seen, fall between the boutique and the in-house organization. There's no vendor professional services organization because there's no vendor within Plo. So it's really, I think, just the boutiques and the IT in-house organization. So again, put your hand up. Who here would say they're from a boutique, from a small company, one people up to 20 people maybe, who do specifically or majority plone stuff? Put your, put, your, put your hand up. Again, that's quite a few, probably just over half, maybe about 60%. How many people would say they're from an in-house IT team within an organization? Uh, maybe about 20, 30 percent. How many people would say they're from somewhere else other than those two categories? One. Fantastic. What's that? 100%. That's 100 percent? Yeah. Did my numbers add up? No. Anyway. Um, one, exactly. And it was a similar kind of thing when I, when I did this at uh, Penn State as well. So I, it's good to see that those... Uh, my, my gut instinct on that was, was right. So how does Plone look from the outside? What do the analysts think? So again, Real Story Group, they produce this thing called the Content Technology Vendor Map. It's probably too difficult to see um, up, up there, but it's a, it's a subway map. And each one of those lines represents a particular type of product or technology. So one might be document management, one might be portals and the products are placed on them based upon the, their capabilities. Clones in the bottom left corner, you can see there on the junction of web content management, portals and content integration, and collaboration and social software. I think that sounds about fair for what Plone does. I think that's quite a good uh, impression there. Um, but what's great about this is it gives you an idea of, as to how external analysts think of Plone in relation to how they think of other particular products. Yesterday, this is very recent, yesterday, again, Real Story Group published um, this diagram, thing called their web, uh, so CXMS is a new term, they, it looks like they coined yesterday yet another term, um, content experience management system. <laughs> so you might have heard of the, heard of the term um, web experience management, and the, you know, people are fighting between whether that's WEM or WXM. Well, C, Web CXMS, yeah, another acronym. But basically, what they're looking at is, is what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, Plone, if you could see it, is towards the bottom left corner, pretty much in the center of those concentric circles there. And along the two graphs, you've got whether the vendor itself, and in this case, the community for Plone, is static or restructuring. And vertically, we've got whether the product is static or overhauled. So you can see, um, you know, some, some organizations, uh, HP or Autonomy, HP have just acquired Autonomy. So you can see the, they're very heavy on the uh, restructure side, for instance. So it kind of shows Plone as being in quite a stable position, actually. Uh, and that's, that's quite interesting to see. It might be interesting to move it slightly up a little bit um, because it might be seen to be a little bit boring in that not much is happening, but it's in a better position, I would say, than um, percussion, typo three, um, you know, some of the others, and further to the left, you know, with Microsoft and IBM. And the color, the color of those dots represents how much they, they focus on this web content 
uh, experience management. And the darker the circle, the more they concentrate on that. So, so Pallone, they believe, is actually fairly well focused on this, which is, which is interesting to see. And the size of the dot represents the size of the, um, of the vendor, or the community in this case. So again, they reckon that Pallone is actually fairly large. And they reckon it's fairly well looking at this uh, content uh, web experience management and that it's in a fairly stable position. So that's quite nice to see, to see, again, the outside view of, of, of our, uh, our community. There was a guy who last year, just over a year ago, just under a year ago, produced a uh, report called Gov 2.0 Guide to Plone. A guy called Michael Walsh. I'd never heard of him before. Uh, he's not part of the Plone community or anything like that. He just produced this article for a site called GovFresh, which is a government um, IT site and one of the things he or the two aspects he picks up there about Plone uh, the strong points are the community and security and again that's that's something that I think is, is is good to see that external people are seeing that as our strength because I think those really are our strengths the Plone community very much is a, is a strength of ours and again security as well and he listed a whole bunch of sites using Plone. And some of these I didn't even realize were, were using Plone. But again, all around the world, uh, Brazil, the US, uh, within the EU, Switzerland, Chile, UN, New Zealand, South Africa, Norway. The, and this, this is just one sector. This is just government. And this was just one report. But this is what this guy has found out from just looking around. And like I said, I, I didn't even realize some of these sites were using Plone. So that's, that's great to see. So I think the reach of Plone is going you know, far beyond even what we know it to be. Picking up on just one of these, um, I was at a trade show in London called Online Information, and we were doing demos of Plone there, and this guy comes up and says, oh, you know, we use Plone. It's like, fantastic. Um, and this is, this is great. In the last sort of year or so, we've had more people come up and, and say we use Plone rather than three or four years ago, we had to explain it every single time. So, the, the, you know, people are hearing about Plone. And uh, this guy's called Christian Sifaki, and he's from the uh, Chilean National... Library of Congress. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're using Plone for about five or six of our biggest sites. I was like, oh, wow, cool. And he said, yeah, the National Library of Congress of Chile. And I was like, never heard of it, you know. Um, but, of course, you know, I thought, well, I guess they must have a National Library of Congress. I guess most countries have a Library of Congress of some kind. And, uh, yeah, sure enough, it's one of the top five Websites, discounting news websites, one of the top five websites in Chile. National Library of Congress, a library about law, and it's one of the top five websites in Chile. <laughs> that's, that's quite amazing. They get 30,000 distinct visitors a day when they peak. They peak twice a week um, to do with the way that their, their, sort of, their, their work week works. Um, and that, that's quite amazing. So he, I, I said, well, this, this is great. Would you, you know, be happy to come back and do a, a sort of a slide cast with me or a, a screen share? And uh, so he did, and I, I recorded it. And if you look it up on Vimeo, you, you, you should find it on there about some of these sites. But the one that really blew me away was this site called Lay Chile, Law Chile. And it allows you to drill down through all of the laws and statutes of Chile and go back through their version history. I do context diffs. I don't know if you can see that there. You can see that there's, there's two laws there, and you can see what has been the red crossed out bits, what has been removed from the law, and the green bits, what have been added. That's, that's amazing. And that's, this, this, is, this is not just Plone. This is Plone with uh, autonomy as a search engine, Oracle XML as a database, and I think they use Postgres as well for another part of the database all mixed in together. So using Plone as the front end, presenting all of this to the user, managing it, and they're bringing all of this stuff together and a whole bunch of web services bringing stuff from various different government departments to bring together. But you can go right the way back to the Chilean um, constitution, uh, you know, in the early 1800s when they, when they s separated off uh, from Spain, and look right the way back to that. And you can see all of these changes and cross-reference between different laws. That just blew me away. I don't know of any other country that has got that level of transparency in their legal process. Uh, and that's running on Plone. And that was just, that just blew me away. So bringing it back to the community, um, I think it's a question of don't take for granted what we've got within the Plone community. There's a lot of aspects of it. And Liz's keynote yesterday, she talked about some of the things that are happening that are coming up in terms of you know, Plone's future, its roadmap and some of the areas we need to work on. But 
Plone um, goes beyond just a piece of software. There's a whole bunch of things, documentation, add-ons, sprints, marketing, conferences, you know, trademarks, Plone Foundation, that all add together. Uh, Tom Lazar quoted in, in his talk, he quoted a, a quote from Paul Everett from quite a few years ago, in which he said, Paul, um, sorry, Plone is not the code. Plone is the artifact produced by the people of the Plone community. I think that's a very powerful thing to realize, that Plone is more than just the software. Plone is everybody out here. Plone is the events that are happening. Plone is the knowledge that's going on, the relationships that people are forming uh, around the world. And I think that's a, that's a very powerful thing to realize. And it's something that I think sets Plone apart from a lot of other pieces of software, even a lot of other open source pieces of software. I think the Plone community is, is, is quite exceptional. There was a, a, a small sort of conversation that went on on Twitter um, regarding Plone user groups. And uh, Domen was, Domen Kazar was saying about, you know, setting up a, a uh, or going to a, a Plone user group meeting. Um, beer tasting, yay. And Dylan Jay, so uh, Domen's in Slovenia, Dylan's in Sydney, Australia, and he said, what's the best way to start a regular Plone user group? Yeah, Domen's sat here. Um, <laughs> And, you know, he was saying, create a mailing list, invite local plone companies. And one of the things that Dylan said was, well, what if there aren't any other plone companies I know of? You know, Australia is a massive, sparse place, and we're, the, you know, we're, we're, we're sat here with nobody else around us. Um, and then Alex Clark from the US, you know, joined in the conversation, said, well, reach out to other Python people. You know, plone fits pretty comfortably nowadays with other Python things. And this is something that I think we need to do more of, is build more bridges with the rest of the Python world. And I think we're seeing this happening quite a bit with things like uh, Pyramid. And again, back to Tom Lazar's talk, if you saw that, talking about using Pyramid in places where you wouldn't necessarily use Plone, where Plone's too heavyweight. They're a very good complement to each other. They're very good. If you use one other tool besides Plone, use Pyramid. It's, it's a very good relationship between them. I went and did a talk. I was invited to do a talk at a, a local um, business association, a Rotary Club association. And I thought, well, what am I going to do a talk about? You know, they don't want to hear about code and commits and all this kind of stuff. And so I thought, okay, again, let's focus on the community. And I did a talk called Archipelagos to Mountaintops. And I talked about the various events that have happened worldwide within the Plone community and talked about the... Uh, archipelago sprint that happened in Norway. This was a development sprint that happened on an island on a former Norwegian naval base in a fjord, in the Oslo fjord, right? These people had to be shipped out there by a little boat um, and they worked there. There was only internet connectivity on one end of the island, right? So they were all working and at the end of the day somebody had to physically pick up the source control server with everything on, carry it to the other end of the island and plug it in to synchronize their changes with the rest of the world. Right? Um, you know, mountaintops, the snow sprints, uh, not very, very close to here, in Freilberg in Austria for a number of years, um, there were the, the infamous now uh, Plown snow sprints. And, you know, these were 30-odd people in a log cabin at the top of a mountain working on code, working on code, drinking beer, going out skiing and snowboarding, working on code, repeating. Um, <laughs> The woman that, that, that ran this place, she was like, I can't believe it. Do you guys ever sleep? And it's like, as a collective, n n no, you know. <laughs> they, people would just be keep working all times a day. You know, if somebody's got something in their mind, you know, they'll, they'll keep working on it. And, you know, you've got the best minds there in one room and you want to make the most of it. That particular venue was powered by a generator. And every night they had to shut the generator down for two hours to refuel it and cool it down. And so people would be there and they'd be like, right, okay, it's, you know, it's three o'clock in the morning, the generator's about to s shut down. I've got a full battery, I've got a beer, I'm gonna press on through until the generator comes back on. And they would do. <laughs> Our internet connection was by a satellite dish. And every so often somebody would have to go out and wipe the snow off the satellite dish because we were getting packet loss to the outside world. <laughs> so, I mean, these are the kind of events that are going, going on around the world with the, with the Plone community. And it really is a, a, a fantastic thing. So really what I just want to leave you with is just mention of going forward, uh, there's two particular events, there's loads of stuff going on uh, around the world, but two particular events coming up, World Plone Day. Uh, this, if you don't know about World Plone Day, it's a chance for local user groups and that to run uh, events 
local to them and try and get more people interested in Plown or just get together a bunch of people, you know, have a beer, talk about Plown, whatever it might be, do presentations. Uh, and it happens simultaneously. This year it's April the 25th, all around the world, apart from Italy because it's a religious holiday on that day, so they're postponing it a few days, I think. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great opportunity. And it's something that I'd, I'd encourage you um, to try and do when you go back to your, your, your home hometowns is to organize something for World Plone Day. The next event is the Plone Open Garden, which is um, the 2nd to the 4th of May in Sorrento in Italy. And it's a fantastic event. If you think about um, all of the conversations you've had here over lunch, uh, whilst having a coffee, you know, whilst waiting for things to start, whilst having a beer, all of those fantastic conversations you have, and then imagine an event that is basically built around having those conversations. You take the open space idea that is happening here as well and move it outside into the garden where it's sunny and there's a pool um, and people can sit down, have a chat, nice discussions, nice warm evening, fantastic. It's a really, really good event and I encourage you to uh, take a look at that as well. So that's where I'd like to leave you and thank you very much. <laughs>